From an Iraq war cover-up to towns ravaged by opioids to the roots of our modern immigration crisis, Embedded explores what's been sealed off and undisclosed. NPR's original investigative podcast reveals why these stories and the people behind them matter. Listen to the Embedded podcast only from NPR. Support for Parched comes from the Grand Canyon Trust, working to safeguard the Grand Canyon and Colorado Plateau while supporting the rights of its native peoples since 1985. Learn about ways to be involved at grandcanyontrust.org. Welcome to my local grocery store. I'm about five minutes away from my home, which is just outside of Denver, Colorado. And I'm here on a regular shopping trip, but I wanted to bring you along this time and pay extra close attention to where this food is coming from, to try to get a sense of what's grown in the Southwest, possibly on Colorado River water. This is where most of the Colorado River goes, to places like grocery stores, like mine and yours. Around 80% of the water, which flows from the Rocky Mountains to northern Mexico, ends up on farms. And I wanted to get an idea of what that meant for me and how the food I eat each and every day comes from this industry. I see a cantaloupe grown in California, right here on this package of baby spring mix. It says grown in California, Arizona, and Nevada. These cherries are also grown in California. Now I'm in the deli section and I see pork sausages raised in Colorado. Here's a loaf of sourdough that says it's made with wheat grown here locally in Colorado. Putting that in my cart. I don't know for sure if this stuff was grown on Colorado River water, but there's a good chance. There are millions of acres of farmland across the Southwest that depend on the river. So in my shopping cart, I have cantaloupe from California. I have lettuce from Arizona and Nevada. I have sausage from Colorado. I have tomatoes and cherries grown in California. And the question is, is how can we keep growing all of this on less Colorado River water? This is Parched, a podcast about people who rely on the river that shaped the West and have ideas to save it. I'm Michael Elizabeth Sackis. The future of growing food in some of the driest places in the country is in question. We learned a lot about this issue in the last episode of Parched. Farms and ranches use most of the water. And to get this system back in balance by using the water nature can provide, farmers will need to use less. Despite that challenge, we still need food. And farmers in the Southwest grow it for their livelihoods. So on this episode, we'll see some of the ways we can keep growing food on less water. There are ways to do it. Farmers are trying out technologies that help them conserve, and some are switching to crops more suited to the desert southwest. Not enough farmers have done these things yet, and they probably won't unless their incentives change. But as the water crisis gets worse, one farmer says the biggest risk for him is not changing at all. Right now, we are on a country desert road about two hours away from Phoenix, Arizona. And as we're driving, we see just open spaces of desert shrubs and really dry land with these beautiful mountains in the background. 
this is a place of extremes. Cities here often top the list of driest places in the country. I see a coyote scamper across the brown landscape. Then suddenly, the horizon line turns a vivid and lush green. When you look out into the distance, you can see these, these little homes and farmhouses, and there's actually palm trees right up against their homes. I'm in desert farm country. I get out of the car and jump over an irrigation ditch. It carves a blue line of water across the parched earth. Alongside are neatly planted rows of crops. It's lined with concrete and it's got a couple inches of water in it. If you look to the left, you are looking at one of the driest places in the U.S. It's brown and brittle and dusty. And then you turn to the right and you're looking at this amazingly bright green lush field. These fields are covered in alfalfa, a type of hay, which is grown across the southwest to feed cattle. I'm going to pluck a little piece out of the ground that's kind of growing rogue here over in the ditch. Here, farmers tap the Colorado River to create an agricultural oasis in the desert. There's lots of sunshine and warm days. That adds up to a really long growing season. And desert farmers can control when and how much water their crops get. Here in southwestern Arizona, there are thousands of acres of lettuce and broccoli and cotton. Forests of date palm trees pop up along the highway. You can stop for a date shake, ice cream blended with dates, grown here in the Arizona desert. This surreal green landscape was created when water was abundant. The future looks much less lush. One person leading the way towards innovation is Josh Moore. Thank I'm you. sorry, this morning has been, this whole week has been a bit of a train wreck in terms of, of my schedule. So thanks for working with me. What's making you so busy right now? With the state of the world in this region, specifically with water, I've been called into a lot of extra meetings. I joke with my wife that I don't know if I'm a farmer or a lobbyist or a policy advisor or some days I'm the janitor too. Josh greets me at the headquarters for the Colorado River Indian Tribe's farming operation. And then of course right now we're in planting season. So uh, we just planted, these are onions right here. The reservation straddles the border of Arizona and California. The dividing line between the two states is the Colorado River. It flows right through the reservation, creating a lush patch of farmland surrounded by desert. We farm almost right up to the banks of the river. We're about 34,000 acres to date, uh, so it's a relatively large farm. I grew up here on the reservation. I'm a member of the Colorado River Indian Tribes. Uh, and uh, from a very young age, you know, my family was involved in agriculture. Josh is in his early 30s and has dark hair and thick rimmed glasses. He's the tribe's farm manager, and he says his background is a little different for the role. I come from an academic background. A lot of my talents are more administrative than, uh, I guess, farming oriented. More so to do with crits posturing as far as our, our water assets and our natural resources. CRIT stands for Colorado River Indian Tribes. Josh is using his background in education and policy work to help set the tribes up for success in a drier Southwest. He's trying to figure out the best way to continue their tradition of desert farming, but on less water. Farming is one way the tribes sustain themselves and make money. So Josh wants to protect their business. But for them, using less water to farm is also about safeguarding the future of the tribes by protecting the Colorado River itself. The river has, has sustained us in our past, and it's hard to see a future where 
without the river because that's what's kind of anchored us here. Across the river from us, there are the Blythe and Teglios, which there are these giant rock figures out in the desert that, of course, research can't necessarily find when they were put there or why they were put there. Um, but it's really interesting that somebody felt the importance of marking the fact that they were there so long ago. And I think that kind of gets back to the key of saying we were here, you know, and we are still here and we will be here. And the only way that we can still be here into the future is if we find a way to protect and conserve this river so that way future generations can enjoy it. The Colorado River Indian tribes are a group of four distinct tribes, the Mojave, Chemehuevi, Navajo, and Hopi. The Hopis have, have had a long history of, of farming, and so I want to think that when my great-grandparents made the decision to, to move to this reservation, it was probably the availability for water and irrigation water that probably helped sell that, that decision of leaving your friends and your family and your home to come to this very different place. We get in Josh's truck so he can give me a tour of the farm. As we drive, I see some fields flooded with water. This is a go-to method for farming around the world. This traditional method of filling fields with irrigation water goes back thousands of years. It's especially helpful in places without enough rainfall. I watch as Colorado River water flows out onto the dry soil, creating a swampy marsh in the desert. It's not the most efficient way to grow things, but it's a proven method that farmers and ranchers rely on. Although it might be really simple to keep doing what we've always done and, 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 and not challenge the status quo, and sure, you know, with flood irrigation, you have the opportunity to really keep your costs low, keep production high, but the fact of the matter is that the climate is changing around us. So to adapt to that hotter, drier reality, Josh and the tribes are trying new things, like how to use rainfall better, and technology that can tell Josh when to water a plant at just the right time to prevent evaporation or unused water seeping into the ground. We're looking at putting in systems of soil moisture monitoring devices so that way we can switch from irrigating based on schedules but irrigating based solely on the needs of the crop. Tech that monitors crops so they're watered when needed, moving away from hard watering schedules, that feels like the future, like sci-fi stuff. This field, uh, it was the first site of our first NDRIP trial. Uh, we grew Milo sorghum utilizing NDRIP, and that kind of really was my first introduction to the company. The more precise Josh can be with where the water goes, the less water he needs. And this field is an example of how he's using new drip irrigation technology called NDRIP. Maybe you've seen or installed drip irrigation yourself in a garden or front yard. Instead of just drenching the ground with a hose or sprinkler, each plant gets its own little source of water. The dripping water is targeted at the plant's roots, which means less water is wasted to make it grow. This N-drip system is a series of black tubes, which are laid out alongside and between the rows of plants. If you've ever seen diagrams in like a biology book of the human body, where you have arteries, you'd see a mass of blue lines throughout their system signifying those veins. That's exactly what this looked like when it was first planted. This method gives Josh a way to be more controlled and conservative with his water. But to move water across acres and acres of crops, usually drip irrigation needs a bunch of expensive pumps, filters, and steep energy costs. And those are some of the biggest barriers that have kept farmers, like Josh, locked in the old way of flooding fields. This is what catapults Endrip into sci-fi, at least in my mind. It doesn't need any of that stuff. Instead, it uses gravity, 
which makes it so much more affordable. I think the thing that makes us the most excited is the cost of this technology. Comparative to other irrigation uh, technology, it's pretty inexpensive. If we were to convert acreage to a conventional drip product, that would probably run us about $4,000 an acre. And the cost to convert flood to in drip has been about fifteen dollars to $1,600 an acre. This new technology costs only a fraction of what drip irrigation used to cost. And since drip irrigation can be such a huge water saver, that's a really big deal for the Colorado River. This end drip technology means money isn't as much of a barrier to farmers conserving water. But $1,500 an acre still adds up, and a lot of farms operate on very thin margins. So paying for that switch can still be a challenge. And Josh points out another barrier. I think the biggest challenge that any, any technology person has is how do you get people who are very comfortable doing one thing to adopt a new technology. And even here on this farm, we had trouble kind of challenging the status quo and challenging tried and true methods to try something new. Uh, towards the end of that project, we, we really learned how to, how to work together, how to pair our traditional knowledge with their technology and the research that they were doing to try to find an optimum outcome. Josh says overall, they're seeing some water savings from this new N-drip technology. Cotton responded particularly well. On average, it needed around 40% less water, and the plants actually grew more cotton than usual. Josh says those kinds of results are very promising. It's definitely not easy to be the person that stands up in a room and says, yes, I want to learn a new method. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about the outcomes for the future. We've seen success so far. Um, we've also seen failure. You know, I'm, I'm going to be very upfront about that, where not every trial that we've done has yielded perfect results. But there is a no- enough success that we are optimistic about moving forward. So this year, they plan to expand to 400 acres. Josh says it will make the Colorado River Indian tribes the top user of NDRIP, for farming in the U.S. The tribes hold some of the oldest water rights in Arizona, and it's a lot of water, more than 650,000 acre feet. That's more than double what the whole state of Nevada gets. But Josh says the tribes see their rights a little differently than how other groups might. They don't want to use all of their water for farming, He says, instead, they want to use it in a way that helps to protect the Colorado River itself. So they're leaving some of their water in the river to help out the environment. I think that the tribe's role in this moment is really that of almost a caretaker in the sense that, you know, this river has sustained us for so long and for generations and it's it's at the core of us, you know, so to speak. I think it's our role also to make sure that, that we, we do everything that we can to protect it. So I, I think that we have to use the rights that are given to us to ensure that this river will continue to flow and really make sure that we're continue to be able to use it to sustain not only our economy, but also our culture as well. Josh and the tribes aren't just changing how they water their crops they're also switching up some of what they grow. They're taking a hard look at what farmers grow the most of in the Southwest. And that's crops like alfalfa used to feed livestock. Because those crops are also some of the thirstiest. After the break, why we grow alfalfa in the desert and what it might take to change that. Hey, it's Michael. Thanks for listening to Parched. If you love stories about nature and the American West, I have another show for you to check out. Terra Firma is a podcast that combines the sounds of the outdoors with reflections by writer C. Marie Furman. Find Terra Firma wherever you get your podcasts. Support for Parched comes from the Grand Canyon Trust, 
working to safeguard the Grand Canyon and Colorado Plateau while supporting the rights of its native peoples since 1985. Learn about ways to be involved at grandcanyontrust.org. As Josh Moore drives around farmland on the Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation, I notice sheep wandering through some of the crops. Josh tells me they're grazing on alfalfa. I always joke around with uh, my wife and I tell her if, if somebody could figure out how to capture the scent of freshly cut alfalfa and put it in a candle, you know, they'd be millionaires. Alfalfa, of course, is a legume crop that's primarily used for livestock feed. In Arizona and California, the biggest use is for the dairy industry. So a lot of that ties back to, to milk production um, and milk consumption. So even though it's not a directly consumed product, like let's say, I don't know, almonds or something like that, uh, it still really plays into the food chain. So alfalfa is grown all over the Southwest to meet our appetites for burgers and cheese. It's 70% of what Josh and the Colorado River Indian tribes grow. My daughter, you know, she's three years old. She always tells me that she's going to be a farm manager when she grows up. She can identify crops just by driving through them. And she has actually come up with a, her own litmus test of the quality of alfalfa, where it's happy, sad, angry. So I, I have unlocked that a sad alfalfa field is one that is pretty water stressed. Uh, an angry alfalfa field is one that is full of weeds. Alfalfa doesn't just dominate the fields here on the reservation. It's one of the top crops grown with Colorado River water because it grows well in the desert and it's a crop that can be stored and shipped around easily. Colorado River alfalfa even feeds cows overseas, like in Saudi Arabia, where they won't grow alfalfa themselves because it takes too much water. But here in the Southwest, farmers pay low rates for their water and they can use that water to grow whatever they want. So farms keep growing feed crops and make good money off it. In the last year, Josh and the Colorado River Indian tribes sold $14 million worth of alfalfa. For as long as people are going to need to drink milk and eat dairy products, there has to be a, a source for domestic alfalfa. We have the ability to produce excellent quality alfalfa in large quantities, and our environment is perfect for growing it. So if 80% of what flows through the Colorado River goes to farming and ranching, and most of what's grown is food for cattle, that means the livestock industry is the single biggest reason why we're running out of water in the Southwest. But Josh's goal is to use less water for farming. So even though there's money to be made in alfalfa, he's trying to branch out. In alfalfa, there's a lot of opportunity to make a profit, but at the same time, we're, we're really interested in, in kind of balancing out what we're growing. So some of the things that we're, we're, we're working on is looking at trying to grow more produce crops, of course, with labor issues that, that, that presents some challenges to us, but we're, we're finding creative ways to tackle them. We've integrated rotations of uh, growing dehydrated onions. Uh, we're rotating in more and more durum wheat. Durum wheat is a huge source of wheat flour for things like pasta because there's high gluten content in it. In addition to that, we're also growing a lot of cotton. I think that in the future we'll also integrate more uh, drought tolerant crops. Um, you know, there's a couple of projects that we're working on with uh, crops such as Waiuli. Waiuli is a plant grown to create rubber. Tire companies like Bridgestone have been investing in creating a domestic supply in Arizona. Waiuli is incredibly drought tolerant and is one example of how farmers might be able to switch to different crops to stay in business even with less water. So there are other crop options for Southwestern farmers like Josh to choose to grow. But most farmers aren't making that choice because alfalfa is an especially lucrative crop. 
we can't hope for a bunch of farmers and ranchers to suddenly become altruistic and sacrifice their livelihoods for the future of the Southwest. They might be growing alfalfa, watermelons, or lettuce, but what they're really growing is money. They'll use the land they have and the water they have the rights to use to run a business, to make as much money as they possibly can. That's true even for Josh. The Colorado River Indian tribes aren't just giving up water. Arizona is helping to fund the upgrades to their farms. And the tribes are getting paid for the water they leave in Lake Mead, the country's largest reservoir. You know, it's one of those things where, as the farm manager, my goal is is to keep as much of the water that we have in productive, beneficial use here on the ground. But I would also like the right to be able to make those decisions, you know, as people not have somebody else determine those rights for us. Here's a twist for you. Ready for it? A study found that when farmers invested in technologies like drip irrigation, like what Josh showed us, they actually used more water. That's because when farmers got more efficient with how to spend their water budget, that meant they could grow more stuff. They don't have to keep their water savings in the river. They can just use it. And this is where Josh has a different mindset. As he stands next to a noisy irrigation pump, surrounded by fields of farmland, Josh says he does want to keep his water savings in the river. He says, as an indigenous person, protecting the river is what's motivating him. He says that's not always the case for non-indigenous farmers. I have never met a person in agriculture who isn't proud to say how many generations, you know, they've been doing this for. And uh, it always kind of cracks me up. You'll hear somebody say, yeah, I'm a fifth generation farmer for so-and-so. And, you know, and I think about like, as an indigenous person, you know, I can't, I don't even know if I can count the number of generations. You know, we've been farmers for a very long time. And I think if we focus on creating an environment or altering our environment to allow us to keep doing this, that I think that should be our focus. They're, they might not be dedicated to ensuring that there's a wet river, but I can guarantee that they're get, they're oriented towards protecting, you know, their their family's interests, so to speak, for generations to come. The federal government is geared up to spend millions, if not billions of dollars, on paying people like Josh to use less Colorado River water. If he keeps those water savings in Lake Mead and doesn't use it to grow more food. Josh can then use that money to make the tribe's farmlands more water efficient. Maybe that means more drip irrigation or experimenting with growing different crops or installing high-tech water tools like sensors that measure exactly when plants need to get watered and apps that automate the process as smartly as possible. Still, these efforts take risk, money, and hard work. It would make perfect sense for Josh to decide not to change, because farms have dibs on the water, and they pay very little for it. It would be much easier for Josh to keep doing what he's been doing. I've been brave in the sense that I've been willing to at least try it. If it works, great, you're already ahead of the curve, right? If it doesn't work on a farm this large, you're out a couple hundred acres or so, which of course, you know, I, I, I don't take that, that lightly in the sense that I, I do everything that we can to hedge against lost, but at the end of the day, farming is a gamble. And at the same time, taking a shot on technology is also a gamble. But when push comes to shove, human health and safety wins out. If there's not enough water to go around, the government would require that household faucets must keep running, and farmers would have to go without as much water. In that case, they might have to adopt these changes without experience or knowledge or much support. So Josh says adopting these technologies now 
on a timeline that works for farmers is the smart thing to do. We have to figure out something now while we have time to, to work out the kinks, and that's the only option we have. I don't want to be in that place where we have to make these rapid changes or costly changes with having no experience with them. For farmers to adopt these changes across the Colorado River Basin, they need incentive. That might be big federal dollars. That might be state-run programs that pay for farm upgrades. Or it might be mandatory water cuts from the federal government. I can't overstate this. Changing how farmers use water probably matters more than anything we've talked about in this series. And whatever the incentive, those changes would make the biggest dent in the water crisis. The proverbial gun is against our heads in the sense where we're in the season now where if things don't change on the Colorado River, we're all in jeopardy. On this series, we've covered big ideas about how to solve the Colorado River crisis. Moving water from other parts of the country. Desalination. We've explored how cities can use less water. And we've delved into how ag, the biggest user of Colorado River water, can cut back. But one last thing we haven't discussed is what a healthy Colorado River would look like. Green, lush, biodiverse, full of wildlife. We're going to cross the border to see efforts to restore long-lost wetlands in hopes of reconnecting people to what they lost so they can build a new future. We cannot just allow nature to disappear and be indifferent. We cannot be indifferent to what is happening. That's in our final episode next time on Parched. Hey, it's Michael. Thanks for listening to Parched. I have another show I know you'll love. Ghost Train is about an ambitious plan for commuter rail in Colorado, how it got sidetracked, and where Denver and other cities might go from here. It's a question facing cities across the country. Find Ghost Train wherever you get your podcasts. Support for Parched comes from Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, whose mission is to deepen understanding and promote conservation of alpine plants and fragile mountain environments. Learn how to support these efforts at BettyFordAlpineGardens.org. Hey, Parched listeners. As climate change forces a water reckoning in the West, we're experiencing different water woes on our coastlines as sea levels rise. And the people living on the coast are on the front lines of it all. I don't think there's any scientist in the United States that doesn't agree that if something's not done, we're gone. From WWNO and WRKF comes a new podcast called Sea Change. Listen to Sea Change wherever you get your podcasts.